there's more than 6 million cases now worldwide with uh, more than 350,000 or so deaths. So it's still, you know, a, a massive uh, impact on the world. And there are countries where it's accelerating rapidly. Brazil, for example, uh, the United States still hasn't got it under control. So it's really uh, escalating uh, internationally. Uh, of course, the good news is that Australia and New Zealand uh, ha have seemed to have it under control. What we're seeing is the small number of uh, outbreaks, and these outbreaks seem to be under control. So overall, we're looking looking uh, well in Australia. It actually just feels like the crisis is so far from us right now. Um, the low number of rates. I think when people are going out, they're seeing more people at shopping centres. There's probably less paranoia as, you know, you might bump into someone in an aisle. We're even talking about football crowds. What's the danger here? Is it that winter's going to hit? Is it complacency? Where do you think we're at there? I think, I think uh, you know, you just walk in the streets now and you see many, many more people than you saw uh, a month ago. And uh, people feel like it's all over. Well, it's not all over. There's still significant risks. Not so much risks uh, in small groups uh, because the whole point is you want to be able to contain uh, an outbreak. You want to be able to be able to track everybody who's been in contact. And so if we're looking at a, a big uh, settings like a football match, like uh, opening up big workplaces, that has a real risk of regenerating uh, the, the spread of the virus, and not only that, but regenerating in a way which makes it difficult for the public health authorities to control it. You know, if it's just even, you know, a, a significant outbreak like in the meatworks here in Melbourne, uh, the, the, the public health authorities were able to get on top of it, find everybody and isolate them and stop it blowing out into the whole community. But if we have very large events like footy matches, like music festivals, then we we have a serious risk. So it's, it's one where we should be really pleased about how far we've got, but we've got to be still careful. And in Victoria, for example, the government has ramped up mm. its uh, its rhetoric and its, and its control by saying, if you can stay at home, do stay at home. Well, indeed, I know you're doing this uh, across from home. The Australian situation and, and where it feels we're at right now, what, uh, do we have any natural advantages? I mean, we don't have some of the hyper-dense cities where we've seen this spread very quickly. We don't have as many cities that get very cold. I mean, Victoria, Tasmania, quite cool, but, you know, the rest don't have a, a true sort of winter. Are there natural advantages we can now sort of point to? Was it acting earlier? What do you think? Oh, uh, look, there, there are a number of aspects, Tom, which we did really well. Closing the borders to China uh, really early was, was, was good. And uh, the fact that we're an island country and... Uh, that that meant we could actually close the borders. And uh, especially when we actually started to quarantine people rather than just saying self-isolation, that was really, really important. There are some natural factors as well, less population density, fewer multi-generational households. Don't forget uh, COVID-19 particularly impacts on older people and uh, particularly older people with multi comorbidities So if you have an environment where there's uh, multi-generational people, multi-generations in the same household, there's, there's a serious risk of spread. Uh, evidence of um, pollution being a, a risk factor as well. So we don't have some of those things that, which helped us, but the big thing which helped us was being in Ireland, stopping the international transmission and doing that early, uh, unlike the United States, for example. And when we look to the potential issues of a second wave, one of the big fears was not having enough hospital beds or ventilators. It appears that didn't even happen, you know, in New York. And we seem a long way from that. I mean, are we almost just past the point of that happening in Australia, given how much capacity is ramped up as well? Yeah. So, Tom, the, 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 when we looked at, especially Italy, where the health system was dramatically overwhelmed in, in northern Italy, and they were the intensive care physicians were having to make terrible choices about who was going to get a ventilator and who wasn't, uh, that, that, you know, this, you know, really sent a shockwave. And we did some modelling at Grattan, which said, look, you know, unless we shut down, uh, unless we introduced a lockdown, we were going to overwhelm the, the health system in early April. Well, that didn't happen. We, we locked down and we didn't overwhelm the health system. Not only that, 
but we tripled the number of intensive care beds. There were about 2,000 or so uh, in the country uh, at the start of this year. There's now 7,000, 8,000 equivalent uh, beds mm. available now. So massive expansion of potential capacity. So, you know, we've done some things. Obviously, still, a second wave is a risk, especially as we come into winter. People are more in enclosed. They're, they're less likely to meet and sit in the parks and so on. And, and so there's, there's a greater risk of spread. Uh, so we, we have to be vigilant and we have to uh, watch what we're doing. We have to be careful about opening up big workplaces and big events. But, uh, you know, we're beginning to see the benefits of what we've all lived through for the past uh, couple of months. If we fast forward a year and we're in a situation in which a vaccine is no closer and, you know, who knows by now, by then they might be saying um, we might never get one. If we're in that situation, we see other countries going for herd immunity, countries that perhaps already had a 20 to 30 per cent, so getting to 60 per cent was a little bit more achievable. What's our option then? Can we sort of recalibrate? Is herd immunity never an option for Australia given our low rate? What would our options be? It's, it's a really interesting question, Tom. Even in the United States, um, where they've, you know, they've had uh, almost two million people uh, infected with the, the virus, um, they're a population of two hundred million. I mean, they're still a long way, a long way off uh, herd immunity. Mm. So, and they've had, uh, you know, more than a hundred thousand deaths. So it's a really terrible, a terrible environment out there. But uh, so I, I think uh, I think the herd immunity strategy is probably not going to work. Maybe Sweden might be an example, but it's going to be very very risky strategy for any country. So I think uh, in the absence of a of a uh, vaccine, and I think uh, I've always said that if a vaccine is available, it's going to be 12 to 18 months away, and it may never come. Uh, but in the absence of a vaccine, we're going to have to be pretty strong on border control. We're going to have to force. Uh, uh, proper quarantine when people arrive, and so if you, you know, if I'm thinking of a holiday uh, in Europe next year, I'm going to have to say I'm going to have to add on two weeks at the end of that holiday to be in quarantine when I come back. So it's you know changes the dynamics of, of whether you want to go overseas or not. I suppose it does. It's just finally and briefly on some practical advice, masks were discussed yesterday at National Cabinet. That is just, you know, standard, perhaps um, make at home face masks, whatever it might be, for public transport. Is it OK to use these types of, you know, non-surgical, non-PPE masks if you wash them every day? Is there any risk here as sort of um, you've got to assume and hope people have good hygiene practices with them? At the start of the pandemic, we just didn't have enough masks for the health workers. So, you know, it was really important to say, sorry, the, the supply of masks is for the health professionals. And I think that was the right decision. Now, more masks are coming on the market. Some of them not particularly effective. I read in the paper today that uh, one is supposed to have pr to protect 95% of the, the droplets mm. coming out and protect 60%. But every bit helps. Uh, on, on public transport, I, I think I'd be wearing a mask, whether it's not quite sure I'm any good at making a homemade mask, but uh, I think uh, I, I'd, I'd be prepared. I think I'd wear a white mask if I was on public transport. All right. Ending with some practical advice. Stephen Duckett, always appreciate your time through this uh, and your expertise during COVID-19. Thank you. Thanks, Tom.